Very good morning, um, dear excellencies. Um, we, are very, we are delighted to be presenting here among this uh, esteemed delegation uh, from Mongolia. I would like to thank Minex uh, and the sponsors for organizing a very well received event this morning. Um, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Tulga has already um, guided into um, a lot of the points that I'm going to cover. Uh, initially, probably a couple of words about us. Uh, we are a merchant bank. We're based in London. Uh, we have offices also in the US and in South Africa. Um, we focus on oil and gas and metals and mining. Um, we therefore have constant contact uh, in Mongolia. Um, I personally worked for Rio Tinto and uh, was a member of a uh, M&A team for one and a half years um, where we took the ownership um, in what was then Ivanhoe, what is not um, uh, Turkish Hill from around 30 percent to 50, 50 plus something percent. Um, therefore, I spent quite a significant amount of time um, on the phone or uh, on Mongolia related uh, issues. Um, we currently have uh, a couple of clients in Mongolia covering coal and covering uh, copper exploration. Um, so we are, I think, uh, constantly in touch with um, what's happening uh, on the ground. Um, what we do is um, we usually work with clients on transformational transactions um, across the commodity sector. Um, you can see here we have helped uh, aluminum companies to raise significant amount of growth capital, but also work with <laughs> mineral sense companies in Africa. Um, etc. Um, bef before we go into just the geopolitical context overall, um, we had meetings with the Department of Defense this week uh, in, in, in Washington, and they asked us, in terms of their strategic mineral strategy, what actually exploration does. So our, 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 our research analysts sat down and <coughs> started digging very deep and looking at sort of the regression analysis in terms of when you spend today on exploration, what does it actually do in terms of um, GDP growth in the following years. And not surprisingly, I guess, there's a relatively high correlation uh, with regards to this. So um, the, the developments that we have seen in Mongolia, but also other Central Asian countries in reforming their mining plans, opening up land packages, will clearly have, if you just look at statistical data, a very positive or additional positive effect uh, in terms of GDP growth and foreign direct investments in the future, in the, in the coming years. Um, so it's not just a uh, belief. I think the hard facts of mining-oriented countries show this very, very strongly. Um, it, in, terms on, in terms of the current developments, I think what we have faced very often as an investment bank is that people, I would say, focus almost too much on political developments. And we always recommend, and especially in the, in the last three years, to rather look through a sometimes very a, 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 a system that appears to be relatively volatile and, and doesn't have um, long-term uh, political stability in Mongolia is currently going through something like this again, even so it's, it's within one party, um, to look really at the economic indicators. The IMF program was signed off now more than two years ago, um, and the Mongolian government, together with the Asian Development Bank, the IMF, and, and the World Bank, I think, has embarked on a very interesting development plan that you really see now uh, resulting in, 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 uh, in, in very positive developments on the economic front. Um, for instance, I think uh, His Excellency the Ambassador mentioned this in 2016, GDP growth was 1.2. Mm, this year, it's at least going to be 6%. It's probably more than 8% in the years to come. And this is at the back of quite a lot of structural reforms that were necessary, and I guess, to understand the political uh, and, and investment attractive next context is, if a country exports 90 percent, um, well, 90 percent of its exports are metals uh, and minerals, then it was no surprise that regardless what the country was doing in terms of stimulus from 2001, that, uh, 2011, that it was hit actually quite significantly. What this all led to was, unfortunately, a relative modest impact on the economy, but a relative negative impact on the fiscal situation, which meant that the uh, uh, international reserves, but also that it uh, dwindled and that international debt uh, went up. Um, since then, there were a couple of structural reforms taken. There were also a couple of painful steps necessary to rail in um, spending. 
but the outcome is not only that debt has come under control and GDP has increased. I think it's very positive to see, um, and that's probably also partly related to certain coal and, and, and copper projects, that also the unemployment rate has come down by 20%. Because usually what you see in IMF programs is you see a, a phase of austerity and it takes quite a couple of years until so say this triggers down um, in terms of employment generation. But this seems to be happening here um, pretty much in lockstep. Um, Probably an, a very important development um, is, is Rio Tinto in this context, and I think there's very few countries um, globally of this size or um, with this kind of mineral um, endowment who have seen such significant investments. Just to recap, um, Rio Tinto um, today has generated almost 2.2 billion in um, cash flows out of OT. It has paid more than 1.5 billion in duties, fees, and, uh, and, and, and uh, taxes to the government. It has then in 2016, and the, at the time when the um, dispute was resolved on various issues on the investment agreement, embarked on a 5.3 billion investment program for the underground of, Hugo so of, of the Hugo deposits itself, um, and was able to arrange a 4.4 billion uh, debt financing package. So this is, these, are, these are quite significant achieve, achievements that I think very positively should reflect on every, everything that someone plans to do in the mineral sector. Um, to date, Rio has already spent 7.8 billion, and I think there's still 5 billion, roughly 1 billion each year, outstanding until 2022. Um, and, and OT will be one of the most significant projects in terms of copper supply growth um, for the next couple of years. Um, the IFM, IMF program we, we, have, we have already touched upon at the bottom. Um, we, we, whenever we engage with the government or with participants or um, World Bank organizations, hear only that the, that the progress in, in all fronts is, is going um, exceedingly well. In, in, in terms of economic indicators now, um, uh, obviously uh, one thing that, that um, is, is, is something that, you, that we hear quite a lot uh, in the context of Mongolia is of course its landlocked nature, which has less of an impact on copper exports, even so clearly China consumes more than 50% um, of globally seaborne rated copper, which means it's the natural home also for both copper deposits um, in in, in Mongolia, uh, but I think even more so, the debate is often about the infrastructure access, and there were various attempts. Um, and I think TT is on a on a very positive path to possibly in its next phase of development, also opening up um, export avenues to other markets, especially Japanese organizations are very very keen via routes uh, through Russia and Russian eastern seaports to actually make uh, Mongolian coking coal available. Um, for the for, for the Japanese uh, steel industry, the, the coal is um, of of fantastic quality, and of course the the the, the asset is one of the largest one uh, in the sector. Um, I think we have here touched on quite a, most of the points. I mean, exports are up, um, foreign direct in, foreign direct investment inflows have increased um, <coughs> over the last couple of years. Uh, as you can see, OT is a, is quite a significant component of this. And all of this is also reflecting, I think this is quite an important uh, indicator, not just in economic, um, hard economic uh, data, but the Fraser Institute, which measures investment attractiveness, and it is measured, this is quite important to understand, it's measured by actually asking a broad base of financial investors how they see markets. And here, Mongolia, from 2015 onwards, has gone from being 59th of 109 to being 36 out of 91. So somehow the, the peer group has also uh, reduced. So there's, a, there's really a, a peer verification of Mongolia becoming a better investment destination. Um, and we will have slides later which show how much money was raised for Mongolian projects. Um, and the numbers are quite significant um, and stand out uh, in the region. Um, It's always a little bit of a challenge. The 10 minute slot is the hardest. Yeah. Um, what, um, what I think is, it's not only that Mongolia has, is still in, in, in a significant untapped frontier with vast natural resources. If you look at, 
if you look at this section here, what you can see is that Mongolia has really quite a lot of strategic metals that, when you look at this section over here, that the US, the EU, and in particular China consider as strategic minerals and metals. Yeah? So there's not only a lot of it, there is also exactly the stuff that um, most of the big economies uh, see as really quite relevant for um, their own economies, which also makes, of course, Mongolia a little bit of a battlefield of strategic importance. Where, so they, clearly Russia and China have always made for political influence, um, but all other nations with their mining companies would also like to get a, a, a stake of it. Um, yeah. If you now look at um, the ability to raise capital um, for Mongolian projects, um, this goes from 2014 to 2018, so it was really through the more uh, difficult times in the commodity markets. Um, clearly, with a, with a really tier one uh, project, Turkish Hill was able to raise significant amounts of not only debt capital, um, but also significant amounts of equity capital. Um, so over the last four years, $3 billion were raised on the equity front, and around $1 billion was raised for these particular companies. What is not in here is the additional $4.4 billion because that went um, onto the um, asset level. Okay, I cut it off here. Um, we are available for questions afterwards. Um, there were a couple of more slides on the importance of strategic metals, in, in, in particular on the battery sector, which people have already hinted on. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.